Thank you very much for that. And again, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. Um, it's, it's always interesting. Where you live, you can never actually talk very often. So it's really nice to have the opportunity to talk in Adelaide. I thought that I would spend some time talking about some general principles around shift work, where we are with the current health research um, in terms of both the physical safety and well-being aspects of shift work. And I thought it might be useful to, to leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for people to ask questions. It's a big topic and I will inevitably give you a small slice of it and there will be inevitably bits that I have forgotten to address or there will be questions that you have around some aspects of that. Um, <coughs> I will warn you, I will be controversial in some of my responses. And sometimes my views may seem academic, but sometimes you might actually find that if you think about them, they have sometimes been reasonably well thought through, and while controversial may actually make a significant difference in terms of how organisations manage the risks and hazards associated with being on their shift work. So I'm going to start off, and I think Part of the question is, particularly for our generations, and that is people who are currently alive, shift work has been a characteristic that we have all known and grown up with. Maybe not personally, but we've all known somebody who's been a shift worker. And we live, in relative terms, in a 24-7 society. However, um, that hasn't always been the housekeeping. Here we go. Oh, we're going the other way. There we go. That hasn't always been the case. And in fact, if you look over human history, um, the vast majority of our history has not involved people working shift work, with probably the exception of the odd shepherd in outer Mongolia or somewhere like that. But for 99.9% of human existence, and most mainly in 99.99% of human evolution, we have been designed for very specific operation during the day to be awake and to be asleep at night. <coughs> and as my kids would say to me, no shit Sherlock. It, it's true. But the implications of that are profound. Our physiology, our metabolism, our psychology has all geared itself to waking up around six or seven o'clock in the morning, being physically active and interacting and socialising and doing all of those things and then winding down from the time the sun sets until we go to bed. And in fact, <clears throat> if you look back into the history of human sleeping behaviour, one of the interesting things that you will notice is that, um, in fact, humans used to go to sleep typically around 7 or 8 o'clock at night during most of the year, a bit later in northern hemispheres when the sun stays up a bit later, and then would spend probably 10 to 12 hours in bed. And they would wake up after what we refer to as the first sleep, and then they would have an hour or two of wakefulness, and then there would be the second sleep. Now, if you think about it, in those days when everybody lived in one hut and there wasn't a lot of privacy, there might not be a human race if we didn't have that break between our first and second sleep, and it was an opportunity for parents in particular to have a moment of intimacy amongst themselves and to continue to propagate the human race. But the thing that I think is important to consider is that what we all think is the world and the way it has been and the way we design is not actually the case. If you looked at it from an evolutionary perspective, <coughs> we're actually designed to walk across the African savannah on a fairly regular basis without staying anywhere for particularly long. And things go bump in the middle of the night. So our whole physiology says if it's night, prepare for sleep, wind down, slow down your metabolism, reduce your interaction with people, and get some sleep. The difficulty is, and this is where the history of this comes into play, for the first 8,000 years of the agrarian revolution, we pretty much didn't mess with that. And it was only with what's called the rise of empire, and here I've arbitrarily chosen somebody from the Roman Empire, but with the rise of empire, and as a result of the agrarian revolution where we had what has been referred to as a surplus, that is, if you go back into most of human history, we managed to collect about 10 calories a day more than we expended collecting it. 
you don't want if you think about it. But with the agrarian revolution, the capacity to grow crops, then there was more calories than we needed and we could have people who didn't have to hunt and gather. And that was where we saw probably from 2000 BC onwards the rise of empires, whether it be Roman, Egyptian. And that was the first hit at where things used to not necessarily happen during the day and nothing would happen at night. That is, we had <coughs> communities, cities, industry and jobs other than um, hunter-gatherers. And you'll see in the start of empires that there was a degree of specialisation. And you'll see, for example, the first accounts of shift work come from around about 400 BC, where in Roman towns, somebody would be guarding the gates at night because some other very clever people had worked out if you attack people at three or four o'clock in the morning, they're really sleepy and take a long time to wake up and you could have killed them <laughs> before they'd actually woken up. So one of our implicit understandings of the physiology of day and night came through that. Um, where we went from there, I suspect, is the next, and post the agrarian revolution of the rise of the empire, we saw the industrial revolution. And what happened in the industrial revolution, revolution was that we basically applied machines to work. Up until that point, everybody had been racing around digging holes with shovels or herding cattle or building things with their hands. And we had tools, but we didn't really have machines. But the problem with machines was they cost a shitload of money to buy and build. And as a result, we had to run them 24 hours a day to get our investment back on them. As with many things, sometimes the turbines have to be going 24 hours a day because the cost of slowing them down or starting them up was more than the cost of keeping them going. So we saw from the 1750s through to the turn of the 20th century an incredible investment by industrialised communities into plant and equipment. And typically plant and equipment that was so expensive that it had to run 24 hours a day in order to justify the investment. And that we had to have people to operate those machines 24 hours a day. The other big area where we saw it was the expectations around emergency services and healthcare and those kind of things which had happened primarily in the 20th century. But we have, in that 10,000 years since the start of uh, what we call agrarian societies, we've seen an incredible transformation in terms of people's expectations of the hours that we work in. Unfortunately, our physiology hasn't adapted to that. And most of the changes, and most of the issues that I'm going to talk to around shift work fundamentally relate to the fact that our biology is not designed to work 24 hours, seven, sorry, 24 hours, seven a day. And there is a kind of culture out there that says, oh, just suck it up, princess, or tough it out, or you can learn to deal with it. You can learn a lot of things you do them often enough, you, you know, bang your head against the wall for a while and only feels good when you stop. You know? And shift work is a bit like that. It's one of those things where the biology of being a human means that the consequences of shift work cannot be avoided. They may be able to be mitigated, they may be able to be minimised, but at the end of the day, if you try to sleep during the day when your body's not designed to do it, you will have a shit sleep and you will be fatigued. And if you do it for a lot of days in a row and you don't get a lot of sleep on those days, you will be tired and you will fall asleep because you're sleeping. And that may potentially result in significant consequences. Over the longer run, it may actually permanently affect your biology or psychology. And I'm going to talk about where we are with current research in this area. So, I thought what I'd do is address the health consequences of shift work. It's a huge area of research. At last count, there's somewhere in the order of 40,000 research papers published since 1950 in this area. I'm not going to try and recite those chapter and verse. And what I'm going to try and do is say, what do we know consistently from the literature? <coughs> what is replicable? And what do we know about how we can mitigate uh, fatigue and shift work as a hazard. So, I'm going to summarise this in three areas. And the first is 
what I would broadly call lifestyle illnesses. So if we look at shift workers as a group, they tend to have a significantly higher level of lifestyle illnesses. And if we look at the literature and say, what is incontrovertible? What has been demonstrated over and again? And if I look up a Cochrane database review, high quality data in the epidemiology, what do I know to be true? And what do I suspect is going to be true as we do more research in the next couple of years and decades? So if we take what do we know that there is clear evidence of, and you know, part of this is the bleeding obvious, we have incredibly clear, incontrovertible evidence that shift work is associated with insomnia and sleepiness. And we will talk about what may happen as a result of that. But shift workers, on average, will get two hours of sleep, on average, less per day during when they are working shift work, and a bit more when they're off shift, so to speak. But on average, they're sleeping an hour to two hours less than the rest of the community, which isn't necessarily sleeping a lot either. Our sleep duration average in industrialised societies has dropped from nine and a half hours in 1900 to seven and a half hours in 2000. So that's a quite a significant drop. There are many, there are very few other variables which have actually decreased that much in the last hundred years. Possibly as a result of increased insomnia and sleepiness, and we'll talk about the mechanism of action a bit later. We have a higher incidence of obesity in shift workers. Shift workers, on average, are five to ten kilos heavier than their otherwise matched controls who don't work shift work. Again, the question of why is that is complicated. There are physiological aspects of being a shift worker which change how you metabolise different types of food at different times of the day. But there are also some very important behavioural mediators of that effect. If you're a shift worker, you don't have as much time available make food, so you often eat in a hurry, and that means you're much more likely to eat takeaway foods or quickly prepared foods that are higher in fat and sugar, blah, 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 all those kind of things. If you want to get in your mind the perfect mental image of a shift worker, and given the age of this audience, you know what I'm talking about, just think the norm. Remember norm in the life unit campaign? Norm is definitely a shift worker. Um, you may like to think of the Simpsons. Homer was a shift worker. So many of those characteristics in terms of lifestyle illness you'll see there. Possibly as a result of the increased obesity, then we see a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. You're about 1.5 to 2 times more likely to suffer from type 2 diabetes as a shift worker, as a non-shift worker. And the suggestion at the moment is that that link is related via the increase in weight or obesity as a result of that. So shift workers eat shit food, get fat, and as a result of that, by midlife, 45 to 55, start to develop the signs of type 2 diabetes. We think they're causally related. We're doing research at the moment where we're sleep depriving people, and we're putting them on a shift schedule which limits them to four to five hours sleep per night for a week, and we can push them in a pre-diabetic sense to 20 years older than they actually are at the time. So we can take a 25 year old, sleep deprive them for a week and they have the same metabolic indicators in terms of their ability to um, perform a glucose tolerance test. I won't get into the details of that, but we can make you 45 if you're 25. And one of the things that we're talking about now is the extent to the sleep loss associated with shift work is leading towards increased levels of type 2 and diabetes. We also see poorer cardiovascular health. That is, we see a higher incidence of ischemic heart disease and a whole range of other cardiac variables. And again, what's absolutely clear from the literature, there are possibly biological factors related to being a shift worker that cause this, but it's also probably due to the fact that shift workers as a lifestyle tend to be less involved in sport, physical activity, exercise, and those kind of things. And it's not surprising. If you think about it, I worked up in a place called Calide in Queensland back when they were introducing 12-hour shifts back in the early 90s. And interestingly, one of the biggest consequences of moving to 12-hour shifts, or as they used to call it, a four-day off roster, was that people couldn't 
play sport in their cricket and rugby teams in the same way that they used to because they weren't necessarily available. So you work in 12 hour shift, you didn't finish at 3 o'clock, so you couldn't get cricket practice. And it wasn't until we said, well, why don't you change the time of cricket practice? But for a lot of communities and for a lot of people, physical activity, exercise is both social and engaged with um, community, and being a shift worker makes it really difficult to necessarily be available to do all of those things. The last area where we have very clear evidence um, is the higher incidence of gastrointestinal disease. And again, that can be as, and I don't want to sort of, well, this may be a bit discriminatory, but it could be as trivial as diarrhea problems, or it could be as severe as major gastrointestinal problems with high levels of ulcers or gastrointestinal cancers. We're um, doing research on this at the moment, and what we've been particularly interested in is the link between the effects of shift work via sleep loss and its effects on what's called microbiota, or all the bacteria and fungus in your gut. And what appears to be the case from ours and other people's research is that once you are sleep deprived, that stresses your body in a broad sense. And as a result of the increased cortisol levels, those increased cortisol levels are associated with declines in the quantity and diversity of gut microbiota. And as a result, we see a whole bunch of bio, gut biota or gut flora related problems associated with that. That's a pretty new area of research. And what we're finding is that the use of fermented foods, which reintroduce healthy bacteria and stuff into your gut, whether that be through eating kimchi or drinking kefir or a whole range of those ones can actually be quite a useful adjunctive treatment for people who are experiencing gastrointestinal problems associated with shift work. And it certainly seems more acceptable than what has been referred to as fecal transplants, which is the other new hot area of the new treatment there. Um, most of our shift workers are not enamored with the idea of a shift smoothie. Um, so some of those fermented foods seem to provide a better one. If we look at the areas that have emerged in the last couple of years, then what we see is that there is some evidence that shift workers have increasing levels of cancer. And again, we're not really clear on the mechanisms of action there. The most advanced research in this area, and that has resulted in changed legislation in Scandinavia, typically shows that there are increases in reproductive tumours, particularly women, and particularly women who work a lot of night work. What's really interesting there, and while shift work has been declared a probable carcinogen by the WHO back about five, six, maybe seven years ago, one of the things that's lacking is a clear mechanism of action. Why is it that shift workers and women shift workers in particular have these high rates of carcinoma? And it could be merely the fact that because they're shift workers, they drink more coffee and smoke more cigarettes and drink more alcohol as terms of a set of what we would call poor coping mechanisms. Or it could be related to some of the fundamental biology. So there has been work, for example, done in Norway about the effects of light exposure at night, the consequent effects of that on melatonin and the protective effects of melatonin against breast cancer. We don't really know, but what we have discovered in the last decade is that shift work in broad terms is a stressor. And at a number of levels, biologically, it seems to compromise the immune function. Whether that be through the stress of not sleeping and the subsequent increases in cortisol levels and their immunosuppressive effects, or through a range of other mechanisms related to social behavioural issues, which also increase stress. We think that there is some logic to the idea that shift work as a stress or compromises immune function, and that's why the diversity of health issues that we see are quite broad because immunocompromised people don't get a specific disease, they get a range of diseases depending on what their genetics predisposes them to. So, um, I spent a year working out at Hillcrest many years ago, and this was the sign over the entrance to one of the wards, which had a particularly low door because it was an old building, but I just loved the 
double meaning here. Um, being a psychiatric hospital with a door that says, mind your head, seemed particularly apropos at the time. And it was working at that hospital for the first time where I was actually working with medical and nursing staff. My, my wife was actually a doctor at the hospital at the time. Um, but working at that hospital, I became acutely aware of the impact of shift workers on healthcare professionals more than the typical industrial operators. But it was, it was very interesting. And what I'm going to try and do is summarise the research about the psychosocial effects of shift work. And to put it in the current jargon, we would be looking at the effects with respect to well-being. So, what do we know unequivocally from the research? I think we know the following six pieces of information have been demonstrated unequivocally. If, if uh, you can have these slides rather than taking crappy pictures of them, we can stick them up on the website or give them to you or bring a thumbstick out afterwards, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what do we know in terms of shift work? We know there's an increased risk of anxiety and depression. Does shift work cause that or do anxious and depressed people attract to shift work? It's probably 80 20. That is, the shift work probably does have an effect, but there are some probably what we call selective pressures that mean people who are prone to anxiety and depression may be attracted to shift work because it's less competitive in some senses, it's less cutthroat, less supervision at night, those kind of things. But we do see an increased risk of anxiety and depression. You're about twice as likely as a shift worker to suffer from some form of anxiety and depression. Whether shift work caused that is not unequivocally the case. You're also at increased risk of social isolation, and that's kind of obvious. But you'd be amazed how many blokes working on mines doing FIFO and are divorced. <laughs> And of course, living on their own, with their occasional sex tourism trip to Bali or the Philippines, doesn't always lead to a psychologically healthy lifestyle. And they live quite isolated lives. And not surprisingly, they tend to worry about stuff. They tend to drink more. And as a result of that social isolation, they tend to experience high levels of mental illness. That increased risk of socialisation is primarily because of the reduced level of support from family and friends of shift workers in general, not just our um, male mining friends. And for many people who have been shift workers, in a funny kind of way, your shift working colleagues are your family rather than your family being your family. And you'll often hear stories of people who are shift workers going, I've got four days off, I'm going fishing with my Mates from work and mum's left at home with the list and nobody to do it and those kind of things. So we do see reduced level of support from family and friends and we do see, for example, for the families a reduced presence of shift working parents in terms of their contribution to family. Um, and then, not surprisingly, increased risk of divorce and or separation and the impacts of that in terms of reduced support and increasing socialisation in terms of long-term health consequences of that. Not surprisingly, <coughs> as a consequence of that, shift workers had lower perceived well-being when we measured them on all of the metrics and scales, even that the state government is now doing with their positive psychology programs, and we'll also see reduced quality of life. That is, if we get people to say, rate the quality of your life on the scale from one to five, where one is complete crap and five is, it couldn't be better, you typically see shift workers on a one to five scale about a half to one point lower on average. If you ask them at the end of night shift, it's probably a couple of points because they don't feel so good that day. But in general, now that doesn't sound like a lot, but across a population, it's actually quite a significant level of reduced or reduction in world being. Okay, the other area, and this is probably much better managed from an occupational health and safety perspective, is the health and safety implications of shift work. So, what is it that you should be aware of? I think there's two things. In terms of health, most of our has chem exposure thresholds and how we decide who should be exposed to what level of chemicals are based on exposure testing that are done on eight hour shifts during the day. 
and that means you've got eight hours of exposure and 16 hours to recover from that exposure. And those thresholds are very appropriate for people exposed to eight hours a day, five days a week, and that standard threshold. The difficulty is, is you can be exposed to chemicals at different times of day and your sensitivity to those can vary by orders of magnitude between the day and the night. As a general rule, things that are bad for you are worse for you at night because your body is immunologically compromised at night because it's in repair mode. So what happens at night, and particularly where you have a combination of working nights and working long shifts, and particularly 12 hour shifts that don't have the four on four off. So for example, in the mining industry, we'll see people working 28 days on and seven days off. Those exposure thresholds may not necessarily be appropriate. So if you do have shift workers, and there have been lots of people who've written about this, and there are adjustment models that you can use to model exposure to hazardous chemicals and to readjust for shift workers. Um, but by and large, most people, when they go through those adjustment processes, reduce their exposure thresholds in order to maintain the same level of safety. Um, <coughs> extended shifts and nighttime exposure also, as we said, leads to sleep deprivation, insomnia, lack of sleep, and as a result, you can see not just health consequences, but safety consequences. Um, and, you know, tired people make mistakes. You know, it's rocket science, and you don't need a PhD to know that. In fact, work any job in the world for a single night shift, and you will know that you're at increased risks of being sleepy, and as a consequence, making poor decisions. But we see some other things that are more subtle. When you're awake in the middle of the night, you're not designed to talk a lot. In fact, you'll, if you've ever driven with somebody who's really tired, you'll notice the first thing they stop doing before they start weaving is they'll stop talking. There will be long periods of silence. It doesn't mean you've had a fight, it just means that somebody's tired. And we see some what we would call subtle effects in organisations associated with shift work and fatigue. There's a reduced level of compliance with standard operating procedures. So work we've done in the hospital system shows that people are really good during the day and going getting the lifting machines and following all of that stuff at night. It's, fuck it, I'm tired, can't be bothered. And the machines down the other end of the corridor. People, when they are tired, intrinsically reduce their level of compliance with stuff. And when you go and talk to them, they say, I know I knew why I did that. Well, we know because you're tired and grumpy and irritable. So you, you, you will see subtle changes in organisational safety culture that can impact on safety. You will see reduced quality and quantity of supervision. There are often, in most organisations, less supervisors on at night, less managers around, and therefore the managers who are there are often stuck in an office and they're not out there managing by walking around. So you need to think about what the consequences of a reduced level of supervision for people might be in terms of compliance with standard operating procedures, etc., etc. And as we know from the literature, and this is unequivocal, that there is an increased risk of accident and injury. We know that shift workers are anywhere between three and 60 times more likely to have an accident than non-shift workers. Not all due to shift work related factors, because in many cases shift workers tend to work in industries where the possibilities of accidents are higher generally, but even when we control for day shift versus night shift um, workers, we will still find somewhere between 3 and 20 times increase in the accident and injury rates for shift workers. So, what can we do about it? Well, the Europeans had a fabulous policy which was they let you retire five years earlier because I figured you were going to live five years less so before you get the same level of time, which was not very much. <laughs> I would argue that while I understand the logic to that approach and that in many cases shift workers have been very much better compensated than their non-shift working colleagues, prevention is probably better than cure. And I think one of the things that we have to be really clear about that is that if prevention is better than cure, then there's a number of things we need to understand. The first thing we need to understand is how does shift work exist?
exert its effects because most of the studies that are published in the literature are what we would call cross-sectional epidemiological studies. That is, they measure shift workers and they measure health outcomes, but we don't have what would be called gold standard, longitudinal, randomised controlled trials and those kind of things. And they're very hard to do. It's not for lack of trying. They are very expensive. Governments are reluctant to fund them because they will just increase their liability. And getting government to pay you money to give them a poke in the eye with a stick is not generally a great strategy. But over the last decade, we have started to see some evidence around how the mechanisms of action of shift work are working, and that at least signals to us some potential ways that we can mitigate the hazard. So, if we look at this in detail, we we'll see there's, first of all, significant confusion in the literature. Is it shift working per se, its effects on your body clock, circadian rhythms, sleep, physiology, all of that things? And there is a lot of evidence, particularly in animal models where we can make people shift work and those kind of things. And there is no doubt that in some of those studies, the disruptive effects of sleep loss and the disruption to the body clock can be associated with changes in physiology and could potentially contribute to some of the health and wellbeing consequences. But the other thing that's kind of interesting is and the current estimates are that somewhere between 50 and 70% of the negative health and safety outcomes that shift workers experience are related to the inappropriate coping behaviours that shift workers use, typically to control alertness and sleepiness in order to engage in social activities outside of work, which is perfectly understandable. But you will see the classic tetrad of lifestyle, illness, risk factors here. That as shift workers, they smoke more, they drink more alcohol, they eat crappy food, and they do less exercise. If we say that somewhere between 50 and 70% of the effects in shift work <coughs> could well be attributed to that tetrad, then that actually leads to a positive outcome. Well, not for the tobacco and alcohol companies, but it does mean, for example, that if the effects of shift work were mediated primarily through their sleep and circadian physiological effects, pretty much nothing we can do with them. And at best, you might just say, well, better let them retire five years earlier. On the other hand, if we do focus on this and say it's about inappropriate coping behaviours, then people need to think about how we might intervene in order that up. And I want to tell you about some very interesting studies that we and others have done. Um, we decided that what we would do is we would put a whole bunch of rats on shift work schedules. Because partly they're trying to work out should people work 8 or 12 hour shifts and all of these kind of things. So what they did, and I'll leave you to think about whether this is a useful metaphor for work, but the work schedule was a linear wheel like this. And then the wheel was on the electric motor and it would just run and the mouse had to keep up with the running wheel. And we would turn the wheel on for 8 or 12 hours and have 16 or 12 hours off. So work was running in the wheel. And then we tried all sorts of different shift schedules over the life of the rat, and the idea was to see what were the health consequences to the rats purely of the circadian stuff. What was quite interesting about that was, well, up with some bloody fit rats. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, they, they didn't actually have many of the health problems that humans, shift workers, reported from shift work. And that was very fascinating. This was done in the late 80s and early 90s, and people wondered what was going on. And it turns out to be the case. Now, the subsequent studies decided, let's try and make it more human. So what they would do is they would have the rats on shift work, and then the rats got to eat. Now, when these studies were first done, they had a healthy rat food. <laughs> and this may sound ridiculous, but there is healthy rat chow, and then there is junk food rat chow. When they gave the rats the choice between what I would call the steak and kale, 
Gabriel salad food and uh, McDonald's Mars bar and iced coffee food, <laughs> guess what happened? The rats selectively went for the shit food. And we saw that as a consequence of that, many of the health problems occurred. Similarly, rats actually love to get pissed, harder as it is to imagine. So, same protocol, but this time we have water and alcohol. <laughs> Guess what the shift work rats did? They were party rats. They would finish their shift and they would get pissed. And yes, not unlike the average shift worker, we couldn't get them to smoke. <laughs> Try as we did, but we did actually do the same thing with nicotine in their water. And again, the same things happen. So what you will see is that when rats are provided the opportunity for bad, naughty rat behaviour in terms of food, alcohol and nicotine, they will do the same things that humans do in order to cope with the effects of shift work. And this subsequently results in mediating many of the effects that we see in shift workers. So, I think the take home message to think about in terms of this field is to say there are probably some unmitigatable aspects of being a shift worker. You are going to lose sleep, but you are going to experience disruption of your body clock and that's going to cause some issues. But there's probably a lot you can do to reduce the harm. So what I'm going to do is talk about a somewhat optimistic approach. And it's based on a harm minimisation. And I think there's two things. There's things that you can do to mitigate the effects, and there are things that you should not do. And because I'm an academic, I'm from the social sciences, and I love to problematise, I'm going to tell you what not to do first. So, Four key points to think about. Don't do any of the following. Many organisations go, and many individuals with an organisation will go, if we only find the perfect roster, all of the problems will go away. There is no evidence to support that position. In fact, the evidence is really clear. If you were to consider shift work rat poison, that different rosters are merely arguing about the relative toxicity of different brands of rat poison. They will all have a negative impact on you, and the differences between shift work and non-shift work, relative to the differences between roster A and roster B, are very different. So many organisations spend an incredible amount of time hoping and wishing that if they just find the perfect roster, all the problems will go away. If there was such a roster, I would have found it, and I'd be a very wealthy person by now. And I figure after 400 years of looking for it, it was then probably would have found it. People fail to distinguish between roster problems and how a change in the roster will resolve those problems, and problems that are shift work problems. So when people come to you and say, I'm having a terrible trouble, let's change the roster, one of the most important things that you can do from a workplace health and safety perspective is to say, is it a shift work problem or is it a roster problem? If it's a shift work problem, change the roster problem it won't help. They modify it slightly. On the other hand, if it is a problem that may be addressed by a roster, then there's some point in having a discussion about the roster. The next one comes down to the politics of industrial relations. I see lots of organisations say, well, we're going to have to change the roster. 75% supermajority have to agree to the change in the roster. Well, that will effectively mean that no roster will ever change in any organisation. The research tells us that it doesn't matter what roster you come up with, about two thirds is about the most number of people who will agree to a roster, because most people's decisions on what roster they work have nothing to do with the health, safety, wellbeing consequences. Is can I get to cricket on Sunday night, or can I get to my kids play, or how much money am I going to get, or how much overtime will I be available for? So most people's decisions around shift work bear no relationship to work workplace health and safety consequences, despite the fact that you are required legally to manage those aspects of the hazard. The other thing that's very critical is, in most organisations, when you change the roster, you just move people from the grumpy people to, from, let me say, 
that we get. You're just shifting the grumpy people to the happy seat and vice versa. That is what you'll, you'll, you'll have somebody come in and say, let's change the roster to X, and it doesn't matter what X will be, and then they'll promise the world for that roster, it's going to improve your sex life, it's going to improve your income, everything's going to be better if only we go to this roster. And then you usually say to the person, why do you think that? And say, well, I worked that roster somewhere else, and it was fantastic. And you say, yeah, but this is somewhere else. Why are you assuming that what worked there will work here? And there isn't actually good evidence to support that rosters in and of themselves are good or bad. And if you look at most of the research on different types of ships, you'll see most of it came from Europe. Most of it was done between the 60s and the 80s and involved incredibly homogenous workforces. Blokes between 20 and 60 who were white, middle class, and had traditional family structures. You only have to work in a factory in Australia for a little while to say what suits an 80-year-old single bloke and what suits a 37-year-old single mum with three kids and Elizabeth are not going to be predicted by the type of shift that they have. So you need to be much more open and diverse in terms of understanding that and realistic in your expectations of what rosters will and won't work. Now, what can you do? Here are the following steps that I think an organisation should do. I think you should define shift work as a workplace health and safety hazard and place it on the hazard register of your organisation if you have shift workers. There is no excuse for not putting it on the table. Every jurisdiction in Australia identifies shift work as a hazard. How many people here are shift workers and don't have shift work on their hazard register? <laughs> and the rest of you are lying. <laughs> when we go and audit organisations, they, they, they think about it in terms of their EBA and there'll be some rules of rostering, but it's not a hazard and it's not a formal part of the safety management system process. If you are going to do it and put it on the register, you should develop the policy and procedures under workplace health and safety using a shared responsibility framework. Unlike many hazards, Shift work has a shared responsibility framework. And under the new WH legislation, both here and now in New Zealand, you have a statutory obligation as an employee to identify a workplace hazard, even if you be the hazard. So if you're too tired to work safely, and the organisation can determine the amount of sleep that it requires to work safely, then you have a statutory obligation to tell your employer and they have a statutory obligation to do something to manage that risk. The thing about shift work and being successful at it is, and being successful at it is that it's a skill. And we think organisations who have shift workers who are at risk should develop competency-based training and education programs to help people identify and mitigate the risk factors that contribute to the hazard. Under AQF, there are now established curricula transport, logistics and infrastructure framework that were originally developed for truck drivers but have now been generalised to a whole bunch of industries and the curricula can be tailored to your particular needs but teach people to be good at shift work. What we actually know from the research is the most successful shift workers are people who've grown up in a shift working family when people do it successful with shift work. It's a skill, you can teach it and people can learn it. If you do have shift work on your hazard register, then you should be under, able to undertake a workplace risk assessment using validated tools. <coughs> you would be amazed how often I sit in workplaces and the shift work policy, if it exists, was developed by the kid doing work experience and then the consultant who came in and everybody feels that they have to double the length the policy to demonstrate that they've added value. And those policies often go to 100 pages, they're never going to be read, they're never going to be used, and they typically have well-intentioned but ill-informed risk assessment tools. There are well-validated tools available in the public domain for free. Get them, or call up somebody who knows about them, i.e. us over at Appleton or Greenville Road, and we will give you 
risk assessment tools that enable you to assess the level of risk associated with your rosters and to determine what would be the appropriate levels of education and mitigation in order to manage that risk. Having done that, you can implement appropriate controls to mitigate unacceptable risk. It doesn't mean you can't work the roster. You risk assess the roster and you determine in order to work that roster what additional controls do I need to put in place in order to manage the risk to an acceptable level. And then lastly, having done that, measure and review the performance of your safety system for managing shift work. What are you monitoring in terms of the health and well-being of your employees? How often are you talking to them about the issues that come up with shift work? What you will notice from this approach is that I'm just proposing that shift work is another hazard. It's part of your safety management system and it should be managed in the same way every other hazard is managed. Whether it's drugs and alcohol, manual handling, or hazardous materials. One of the key problems that people have at the moment is when they manage fatigue, it's going, oh, don't talk about that, it's going to cost us 10% of the next EBA, or, oh my God, shift work review and fatigue management plan, that's secret code for overtime reduction strategy. Fatigue, shift work, and those issues often get caught up in the industrial arena because they have been traditionally managed in the industrial arena. The single biggest step forward your organisation can make in terms of managing shift work and fatigue as a hazard is to actually manage it as a hazard. Embed it within the safety management system, measure, monitor and review it as you would anything else. It also gets it out of the EBA discussions and it puts it into the WHS committee and a whole different governance mechanism for the organisation which is often a lot less contested. So on that note I'm going to finish. Um, my phone went dead, so somebody might have to tell me what the time is and I'll tell you how long we've got for questions. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, sorry about that. So a bit late, so we'll be <coughs> longer. Okay, thank you very much. And um, any questions that people have? Stunned silence. <coughs> Must be the after lunch session. Yeah. Rotating or fixed shifts, what's uh, better and what's a, what's a suitable time? You can hate this answer, better for whom and according to what criteria. That is, I would argue, and being unashamedly controversial here, the idea that there is a right shift and that everybody's going to respond in the same way to it is fundamentally naive. If you look at the research literature and evaluate it and say, it depends. It depends what you measure, it depends who you measure. So rotating shifts, by and large, are what we call a share to ship model. That is, everybody gets equal amounts of crap. <laughs> Permanent night shifts means one group of people, if they don't like night shift, but that's all they can do, get all the ship. So the question is, is lumping it all onto a third of the people or sharing it out equally better or worse? And that will depend on equity issues, it can depend on exposure and a whole range of things. I will make the comment that lots of people like permanent night shift because it's, what do we call this, a spousal contact minimisation. <laughs> <laughs> so I work nights in a nursing home, so I'm not home and then you go to work and there are a lot of families that at the end of shift work it's the end of the marriage because it's, oh my god, we've managed to live separately for 20 years <coughs> and the family's kind of hung in through that. You see a lot of families when the shift work finishes, it's, Oh my God, I've got to put up with you for eight hours a day. So I, I, I suspect there's no simple answer to that, and I expect that there are some people who the suits, not always for their best interests. But we've seen increasingly in the last few years people doing it to reduce their childcare costs. You work during the day, I'll work at night, and there's always a parent at home. They don't tend to have many more kids. <laughs> How does it work if you give them the choice? Have you seen that model work? Give whom the choice? Workers. Oh. Choice working in shift work. Does well, that work or does it not work? It will depend on the level of maturity. It will depend on the degree of unionisation and union agendas in the workplace. And it will depend on the ability of management to get out of their own way. So it's a complex question. 
it is very clear from the research that employees who are involved in the design and implementation of shift system will be far more likely to buy out, buy off of it. What we generally see as an optimum process is for management to say we need X bars on Y seats with Z skills at the following times and what we do say is they need to parameterise an appropriate solution. And then usually with a consultative group of some kind, we come up with a process of how do we get the right bums on the right seats with the right skills at the right time. And say so the management provided they get the right bums on the right seats at the right time with the right cost, do you really care what roster they work if they're happy about it? There's a lot of managers who go, no, I'm in control. I have to run this. I'm the solver of the problems. And I wouldn't say anything about copper sitting here. But <laughs> tradition of that in South Australia, shall we say. So I think, you know, an ambulance from the other side, where the employees have wanted a roster and nobody's really challenged it. So I think there are lots of issues around that. But if employees are involved, the difficulty comes when often a management team says, okay, you sort it out, and then they come back with a system that doubles over time and increases salaries and exactly. And that's not very realistic because then all management do is no. So I think if you set the parameters on a solution and then help the people do it, you've got to be a bit careful who's on that committee though. Because the loud people who always put themselves up for those committees usually say, well, I'm going to advocate the roster I want. And often those consultative processes don't provide access for people who have significant family commitments, women. There's a whole bunch of people whose voices don't often get heard there. So if I was going to give you some advice of an employee generated one, you have to make sure that the committee works as not as warriors whose job is to, you know, win the roster that I want, but their job should be, as politicians, should be to represent a constituency within the workforce. We actually focus on being messengers, not warriors, as part of the training for that process and say, okay, you're here representing the following people. Have you talked to them? What were their opinions? Have you documented and then show? Because what you'll find happens in those consultative communities, there'll be two things that people say. Everybody loves it, which means I love it. Everybody hates it, that means I hate it. So the ability to act as a representative of a constituency is a skill that you need to work a bit. And you need to work with employees so they pick the right people to represent. So the way we would do that is to create a position description for the skills necessary to be on this committee. And then we elect them, as that is the case. But we can actually shape people's selection of appropriate people, and particularly to make sure that it's not the usual suspects, or sometimes, do you know what I mean by the pineapple pub? Okay, so you know, for those of you who don't know, the boss is golden circle. So the boss of all, all of the people who are going to say what is expected to be said. Any other comments? Yes? Um, I'm just trying to visualise my control plan following this workplace for success. Yes. And you suggest that risk, uh, mitigating the risk is the best control, because changing the roster is not going to make any difference. May not make any difference, yeah. Um, so given that our um, after the staff choose that, they we don't have a rotating roster, they just choose not to. Um, so the, the controls are going to be around health and lifestyle. And so is, our, is the control that, that we've got power over is just going to be education? Well, that would depend on your view of safety at one level. I think at a minimum, you have a informed consent model. Are the employees aware of the risks associated with working time arrangement practices and retaining? What does the research literature tell us? And are they making informed consent as to full knowledge of the risks that they're taking on for themselves? I think that's the minimum position an organisation can take. In terms of the degree to which you would intervene, I'm going to ask you a question with respect to another hazard and just check your emotional response to that and see how it makes you think about fatigue. So if people came to you and said, look, I know we have to wear PPE, but it costs the 
totally shitload of money. I don't want to wear it. I hate wearing that stuff. So how about we make an agreement that I won't wear the PPE, you don't have to buy it, and it's all good. Now, people look, I can see this on people's face, you can't do that, it's ridiculous. We do that in shift work all the time. We allow people to self-assess and self-mitigate in the absence of any evidence to the contrary. If we look what's happening in the litigation areas here, there have been a number of class action suits in the US and there's a couple underway here where people are saying, you let me work shift work. You didn't tell me the risks of being a shift worker and I've got all of these health consequences as a result of it. You're liable. Now, the first couple of cases in the US which were run by the rail industry, going back 40 years, the court ruled well, 40 years ago, the companies couldn't be expected to know that. But in the last five years, the state of knowledge is such that companies can be expected to know that the consequences of shift work are as such, and you have a reasonable expectation that you inform your employees as to the hazards, blah, 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 blah. The judge in that court case in the US ruled that he didn't find the company liable, this is a couple of years ago, but should that court case come again in another 10 years, he would. So I think it's a bit like drugs and alcohol and a whole bunch of hazards, community expectations change over time. I think the smart money in an organisation would be to say that it is a hazard, we have to reasonably inform people, and we need to be able to demonstrate that they made an informed choice. And if we have any work practices that are egregious and are demonstrably bad for health, we should probably have a good defensive legal position as to why that was necessary and no other option was available. And yet there are situations where that is the case. Emergency services are a really good example of that. And if you work in healthcare, we did some work for Queensland Health a couple of years ago, and the issue there was, as they said to us, Drew, we don't have enough doctors to work in regional Australia. There's only one doctor in most towns, and we want that doctor to come 24-7. And they had to spend a lot of time carefully arguing their position, which is that a tired doctor is better than no doctor at all. That is, the risk of continuing to work is less than the risk of ceasing to work. But that was embedded legally within their policy, so they can say, this is a defensible <coughs> legal position for us to take. And that's why you'll see, for example, in emergency services, SES, CFS, and a lot of those agencies now, they're starting to say, we have done the risk assessment and not sending an ambulance off of <coughs> out in the regional community to an accident because they've exceeded their 12 hour shift will not lead to a better outcome. And in my view, from a risk based perspective, that's a perfectly legitimate position, but make sure that position is documented before the event, don't be making it up after the event because it will look somewhat post hoc. But we should stop at this point and I'm going to hang around. For, oh, one more? Yeah. There's, um say a 20 minute kit or something like that, is that a, a tool that you can use for shift workers or not? Yeah, sleep is a fabulous thing yeah. to restore. And the thing to be very clear about, all sleep is good, more sleep is better, but the thing you have to be careful about is that if you do have a nap and then wake up, there can be a, a period of what we call sleep inertia or sleep drunkenness. And that can vary between 5 and 20 minutes when we try to measure that. So if you do give somebody a nap, don't give them a nap and then throw them into an ambulance driving at 100 kilometres an hour two seconds later on an emergency call. So when we work with ambulance and ACT, we actively embedded napping strategies within their fatigue management plan. But if you were napping and the phone did go off, you didn't answer the phone and write down the address and you didn't drive the truck, you stood in the back and woke up on the way to the incident. So I think, yes, it's a fantastic strategy to use. Caffeine can be just as effective, but make sure you know the ups and downs of that. There are very good napping policy guidelines and stuff around. And if you can't find them, drop us an email and we'd be happy to send them to you.